the coin. Mystery writers like to say there's no such thing as a perfect murder. But maybe they're wrong. Toronto. In this Sikh neighborhood, you can speak Punjabi all day. Young people marry according to their parents' wishes. People find each other jobs at businesses. Like this bakery. Which is why, in 1988, the city's favorite rye bread is baked by Sikhs. Someone like Ravi Bethel. <laughs> Ravi is a hard-working, fun-loving 22-year-old. Everybody likes him. He's got no known enemies. But on the night of August 2nd, Ravi does not come home from work. <laughs> For 24 hours, no one has any idea where he could be. His family grows more worried. Shortly after 6 p.m., the phone rings. A man whispers, I am. Your son is dead. That's when police are called in. No. No. In true crime, investigation and conviction may take years. But every detective knows that the crucial clue is always there somewhere in the first 72 hours. <laughs> 24 hours after an anonymous caller says that Ravi Bethal is dead, police assign someone special to the case. I was born in India, I'm a Sikh. Uh, I have certain language skills, and that's the reason I was brought into the investigation. Detective Sidhu is now a senior intelligence officer, but in 1988, when this case broke, Sidhu was a young detective trying to find out why Ravi Bethal was missing. Like many Sikh families, Ravi and his wife come together through an arranged marriage, and there have been problems. Ravi's father points an accusing finger at his son's pregnant wife. He says if anything happened to Ravi, his in-laws in Chicago are behind it. He hints it has something to do with the dowry, but refuses to say more. Next stop, the bakery where Ravi Bethal was last seen. Ye Sidhu and his partner locate Ravi's best friend. Though he's reluctant to get Ravi into trouble, detectives manage to convince him that talking to them is the best way to help his friend. The friend says Ravi got an unexpected phone call around 11.45 p.m. Though his shift wasn't over for hours, he said this couldn't wait. So around midnight, Ravi flipped him a Mickey and asked him to sign out for him. That was the last he'd seen Ravi. I'm not glad. Reluctantly, he adds one important fact. The call was from a woman. The night he went missing, he did tell a friend that he was going, he was on his way to see his girlfriend. A girlfriend and a pregnant wife? I don't know, sir. Detectives tracked down another co-worker Ravi talked to the night he disappeared. It was common knowledge that, that he had a girlfriend. As a matter of fact, he had more than one girlfriend. She says Ravi was popular with women in the bakery, but there is one in particular that she remembers. About a year ago, Ravi seemed to have his eye on a woman named Ravana. When detectives ask her if this was more than a workplace flirtation, she tells them about the day her boss asked her to get boxes from the upstairs store room. <laughs> detectives wonder if Ravana is the girlfriend Ravi went to see the night he disappeared. 
but the co-worker doesn't know. All she knows is that Ravana quit the bakery more than a year ago and moved out of town with her husband. The next day, Detective Sidhu gets his first private interview with Ravi's wife. She was very humble, very simple lady. They only had been married for a short while and uh, very upset. And uh, that's all, you know, just like a, a normal wife who would be upset. Sidhu wants to find out if she knows anything about a girlfriend, but he wants to be tactful in case Ravi still shows up. Ravi's wife reveals that a few months ago, things got so bad that she secretly packed her bag and went to live with her family in the States. But Sidhu can't get her to say why she left or why she agreed to come home. As the 72-hour mark approaches, police discover Ravi's car abandoned 10 minutes from the bakery. The car has no plates and has been vandalized. After 72 hours, we were, we were um, a lot more concerned uh, that, that he hadn't been, hasn't been found yet. Shortly after this, a witness claims he saw someone run from Robbie's car to a second car the night Robbie disappeared. Detectives wonder whether the running man was Ravi or the person responsible for his disappearance. But it was too dark for the witness to get a good description of the man or the driver. Ravi's father now comes up with a new theory. He tells Detective Sidhu about his son's run-in with members of the Babar Khalsa. Babur Khalsa is a militant Sikh organization founded in India, and they have cells in Canada. The Babar Khalsa, it's a rumor, coerce workers to contribute towards an independent Sikh homeland. Ravi's father says his son not only refused to give them money, but threatened to write letters exposing their members to the Indian embassy. As they're following this up, police in a Toronto suburb get a disturbing call to come to a wooded area. Homicide detective Paul Carroll vividly recalls arriving at the scene. It was in 1988 and uh, we'd received a call that uh, Initially, it was thought to be a, a baby in a bag was the initial uh, radio call. When we arrived, we discovered that it was in fact a burned uh, human remains of, a, of an adult. The skull shows signs of severe trauma from a heavy object. The orbital bone uh, around the eye had been fractured and there was a severe fracture in this part of the, uh, the jaw and the skull as well, which was consistent with a pretty severe blow or several. It's clearly a homicide, and someone is trying to hide the victim's identity. There was a few uh, items located around the body which eventually uh, assisted us in making a positive identification. Uh, there was a Seiko man's watch which led us to believe it was in fact a male. There was a uh, necklace, a uh, gold uh, pendant. Detective Sidhu and Carol, now a team, undertake the delicate task of showing the jewelry to Ravi's father. The pendant was actually uh, customized um, and made by their missing person's father, who was a jeweler. Ravi. That was identified by the father as he having had made that for his son. <laughs> Detectives now know Ravi Bethal was murdered and that the killer or killers have taken great pains to cover it up. Boom. 
where it really should. The night he went missing, Robbie Bethal told his friend at the bakery he was off to see his girlfriend. Now that it's a homicide, detectives press Robbie's wife for answers. Does she know about Robbie having a girlfriend? Our investigation showed us that the victim and his, his wife uh, had, had been having some marital problems. Painfully, she recalls cleaning up after a party the month before Robbie disappeared. He returned three hours later, and he'd been drinking. Joel, she actually confronted him, and he confided at that point in her with her that he had in fact been at this woman's residence. So it was confirmed that he was having an affair or had had an affair. In he said he'd been in love before he was married and he wasn't going to give her up. Detectives ask if she knows the woman's name. She says the woman's name is Hovana. The same woman who Ravi reportedly had an affair with at the bakery. But when police interview Ravana, she denies it all. They'd never been involved romantically. She didn't have any idea what happened to him, that she knew nothing. Basically, I moved away and uh, from that area of Toronto and hadn't seen him in uh, several months. She was uh, quite firm and uh, didn't appear to be nervous. And her answers were simple and straight. Detectives also questioned Ravana's husband, Sukhvinder Shagil, about Ravi's disappearance. Shergil says he only met Ravi once, at a dance for bakery employees more than a year ago. Something doesn't add up. Sidhu and Carol apply for a wiretap. When it's turned down for lack of evidence, detectives have no choice but to close the investigation into Ravi Bethal's murder. Months later, Robbie's widow and newborn daughter moved back to a family in Chicago. Five. For six long years, there are no further leads. It looks like someone is going to get away with the perfect murder. Oh. Until one day, police receive word that a Sikh man has new information relevant to the case. The man is currently in jail for sexual assault and slated to be deported at the end of his prison term. He's willing to exchange his information for permission to immigrate to Canada. In his videotaped testimony, he says he was a friend of Sukhvinder Shagil. They'd been police officers together back in the Punjab. On the night of August 2nd, 1988, he received a phone call from his friend Shagil. He tried to find out on the phone what had happened, but he wouldn't tell him. He just asked him to come over and asked him to come over in a hurry. Right. He arrived there and he entered the house and he noticed a lot of blood. He'd known that Shergill's marriage to Ravana was in trouble. It's a weapon for her. Shergill told him that he had surprised his wife and her boyfriend, and the boyfriend had tried to attack him. He said he killed him in self-defense. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. He advises that he was afraid and didn't want to help, but he was threatened by his friend and uh, that uh, he needed him to help, and if he didn't help him, that he would kill him. As a former police officer, Shergill figured it would throw the investigators off the trail to abandon the dead man's car near the bakery Rain. and put the body somewhere else. <laughs> and around two, they found a wooded area off a side railing. Once at a site that they had chosen, our victim was uh, doused with gasoline and uh, was set ablaze. And so it 
The informant is hoping his cooperation will let him stay in Canada. The question for detectives? Is a single word of his story true? <laughs> detectives need to find something to verify the informant's story. Really, the only evidence that we had was the statement of uh, our jailhouse informant. So we had to take a close look at that and make sure that what we were getting was, was uh, on the up and up. They rewind the tape to the part where the informant mentions the burning of Ravi's body around 2 a.m. They know that a melted watch had been found by the charred body. The watch is forensically dissected to help determine the time of death. We wanted to see if we could tell uh, if the watch had stopped at a particular time. We took the watch uh, to the engineer and, uh, and opened the watch up. We found that the workings of the watch had actually stopped at uh, between 2.11 and 2.12 in the morning on the 2nd of August. This corroborates the 2 a.m. time mentioned by the informant. <laughs> Police pay a 5 a.m. visit to Sukhvinder Shergil, now divorced from Ravana. Well, I translated uh, his rights um, for counsel, that he doesn't have to make a statement, and he stated that he didn't wish to make any statement. Ravana is also arrested. As she watches the informant's video, she breaks down. She admits she lied to police and that she did have an affair with Ravi when they worked at the bakery. But she broke it off when she became pregnant with her husband's child. She wanted a fresh start. She quit the bakery, and she and her husband moved out to the suburbs. But Ravi tracked her down. He started calling. He said he couldn't live without her. Finally, she told him it was over. What he wanted just wasn't possible. They were both married. She had two young children. He had a child on the way. But still, she says, he wouldn't let go. Then he did something truly bizarre. Unbeknown to her, he taped one of their phone calls where he got her to talk about intimate details of their affair. And then he gave the tape to Shergill. Maybe he wanted them to break up. You know, by giving, handing over tapes to Shergill, they'll have a conflict, they'll break up, and then he'll marry her, something like that, you know. But it was very odd for us to, to see that handing over tapes. But Ravi's plan backfired. Shergill was incensed. He insisted his wife lure Ravi out to the house. Well, she was threatened by Shergill that if she didn't place the call, that he would leave her. Wanting to believe Shergill when he said he just wanted to scare Ravi, she was waiting for him as he came through the door. Oh, it's me. It's me.
we learn of a couch that uh, was in the living room at the time of the murder and that it had a huge blood stain on the back. And she tells us a story of how she was ordered to cut the blood-stained portion of the back of the couch out and re-sew another piece of fabric onto it. Though Shergill, the ex-cop, thought he had successfully covered up Robbie's murder, he had foolishly kept the couch all these years. When police went with the search warrant, they, they located the couch. There were blood drops were still around the sofa, and that's what police recovered. The DNA of tiny specks of blood they find on the couch proves to be Ravi's. Ravi Bethal found himself in the oldest trap of all, a love triangle. This burning obsession for another man's wife consumed not only him, but everyone around him. You can look at the parents, the lost, um, a, a, a grown-up, healthy young man. You look at the wife, she lost a husband, and then you look at the child who doesn't have a father. It's, it's a real tragedy. Because he helped solve the case, the informant is acquitted of his role in the murder and given landed immigrant status after his release from jail. Ravana receives two years as an accessory to murder. And Suk Vinder Shergill, who tried to commit the perfect murder, is convicted and sentenced to life. The stories on 72 Hours are true. The detectives and forensic scientists are the ones who actually worked on the case. Mm -hmm.